And with any luck, you can see me and you can hear me and you can see slides. And if you can't, somebody better tell me. Uh, life, death, after life, you know who I am, you know what this is, you know what we're doing today. The wonderful world of Hinduism continued. Um, we just had sort of a drive by <laughs> session uh, last time. So we'll, we'll go back and we'll unpack Hinduism. We'll do something interesting. Last time we compared, we started off with Abrahamic religions and we compared the Indian worldview, quote unquote, the classical Hindu worldview, as in structural opposition to Abrahamic religions. And, you know, that is a, a relatively useful model uh, whereby to understand broadly uh, some things about the history of religions. Um, now what we'll do is we'll start off with Hinduism and I'll show you the duality that exists within Hinduism itself. Okay, so we mentioned um, that unlike many of the religions of the West in particular, Hinduism isn't a thing. It's not something that stems from a central uh, text or founder or, or moment in history. It is a jungle. It is a set of things that are interrelated. It's an ecosystem of ideas. Yes, there are philosophical, uh, mythological, theological, ethical, uh, you know, um, practicing strands that are in this, um, this, this je ne sais quoi <laughs> called Hinduism. We talked about the extent to which that term was coined for the sake of census as a catch-all phrase for everything happening in India that wasn't a specific thing, right? So this is the jungle. This is the Indian jungle. This isn't a specific species. Yes? If you keep that in mind, then you, um, you'll understand why you might be confused. <laughs> you'll understand that you should be confused because this is an elastic term for a variety of traditions. Nevertheless, there are two essential strands that I want to convey to you today because they're very important. Yes, although it's an umbrella term, Hinduism, um, Hinduism understands itself as hailing from Vedic religion. Okay, let's bracket off uh, everything we know about Hinduism and just look at this thing we're calling Vedic religion. This is a uh, tradition, a religion, um, a culture that belong to the ancient Aryans. They call themselves Aryans. Aryan is a Sanskrit word that means um, noble, refined, upper crust, we say. And they, uh, they also had other cultures or another culture that they refer to as sort of dark-skinned others type of thing. So this, um, this narrative is fraught with issues. As I mentioned before, uh, there was an influential thesis that, oh, well, you know, the Aryans came in and they invaded India sometime in the second millennia BCE. And, and that's been, that's shifted to, rather than the Aryan invasion theory, it's the Aryan migration theory. And then as our uh, textbook author moments uh, says, he quotes Gavin Flood, who was a scholar at Oxford who um, has written uh, um, a number of things, but he, he writes sort of uh, introduction Hinduism textbooks. And uh, Gavin's basically saying, look, there's been some doubt cast on that, on that theory. We're not quite sure how much of this, uh, what we see in the Vedas or in these ancient times comes from the migrating Aryan culture versus the indigenous Dravidian culture. Now, um, it's, it's abundantly clear to me that Aryan religion, uh, Vedic religion, is an Indo-European religion and has what we may think of as a pantheon that's not dissimilar, not entirely wholly dissimilar from the ancient Greek pantheon. For example, one example, uh, one, one uh, point to loom in that is that 
uh, the king of the gods of heaven. First of all, there is a king of the gods, a leader of the gods, and there are gods in heaven that have some loose social structure, is Indra. And Indra wields the thunderbolt. Does it sound familiar? Well, it should, because Zeus, the king of Greek gods, also wields a thunderbolt. Now, that's not to say that there aren't vast differences between um, what we see in the Greek skies and what we see in the Indian skies at this point in time. Nevertheless, there is a sort of family, an Indo-European, an ancient Indo-European family of religions and languages. And Sanskrit is connected to and related to Latin and Greek, not Tamil, for example. Right? So these ancient Aryan uh, Vedic people, they had a religion that was predicated upon fire sacrifice. So there's fire into which you sacrifice things. It's not a misnomer. Um, all kinds of substances, uh, all kinds of herbs, uh, in earlier times, animals. Um, uh, uh, up till this day, ghee. Tasty, but more than tasty, it's, it combusts well in the ritual fire. And it's sacred. It's a sacred substance. Clarified butter is the English term. So whatever would be offered, uh, whatever was being offered would be offered into the sacrificial fire, but not just by anybody, by a Brahmin, by someone of the priestly caste. There were four castes. There were the Brahmins who were the, 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 the priest scholars. They were the Kshatriyas. You don't have to know the castes. Uh, who were the scholars, who were the administrators, the warrior administrators, the Vaishyas, the artisans, the, 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 the business people, the merchants, and then the Shudras, you know, the servants, those who did servantile work. Anyhow, at the apex of this uh, system, there is the individuals who are trained, who, who, who have the ritual purity and the training to properly enact the Vedic ritual. It's a highly sophisticated, specific uh, ritual system, right? So with scrupulous care should the offerings be made. With, 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 with precision should the mantras be uh, uttered. And the mantras were in the ancient language of Sanskrit. And Sanskrit is still used today for mantra. If you go into a Hindu temple, you'll hear Sanskrit. Sanskrit that hasn't differed a whole lot from the way it sounded thousands of years ago because the language itself uh, bespeaks a, a culture that has a, a phenomenal um, um, obsession is the wrong word, but maybe obsession is a word, but a phenomenal um, um, affinity for understanding the production of sounds in the human mouth and how to safeguard against them slipping into, for example, Texan English versus New York English versus London England English versus Australian English versus yada, yada, yada. You don't have that in Sanskrit really, right? So the mantras are uttered precisely um, uh, with care uh, as something's being offered into the ritual fire. Why was there so much care? What was this all about? What were they up to? Right. What was it? What was going on there? Well, they were in the process of manipulating reality, of appeasing the powers that be, of bringing rain, of seeking blessings. Right. This was a system uh, in the religious uh, imagination. This was a system that was geared towards the pacification of the powers of nature. Yes. The ingratiation of the gods on high. Yes. I mentioned that uh, one of the few things, if anything, that can be said uh, that's consistent throughout the jungle of Hinduism is this, this the soil is Vedic, right? The, the, the Vedas are revered. The Vedas are these collections of, of hymns, tales, rituals in this ancient um, sacerdotal tongue in Sanskrit. Right, um, there are four Vedas: the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Tava Veda. Um, notable, uh, I, 
our text talks about this as well, is that the last one, and they're, they're generally at slightly later epochs in, 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 in the Vedic uh, period of history, the Atharva Veda is more related to spells, uh, formulas. Yes, Salma Veda, Nidra Veda, hymns mostly, Rig Veda hymns, a collection of hymns um, to various gods, a hymn to Agni, the fire god, a hymn to Indra, the, the thunder god, or the, 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 the lord of heaven, a hymn to Soma. Soma is this, this deity uh, uh, and substance that, that gives bliss, you know, you know, whether it was, uh, whether, who knows, who knows what it was. Anyhow, um, the Vedic revelation is not considered to be authored. It's considered unauthored. It's considered to have been channeled, seen by the rishis. A rishi means a seer. So they sort of, the idea is that they just downloaded this through the cosmic wireless. So these are primordial um, sound energies that were channeled. And so they're given the status of, of shruti, that which was heard, because it was understood that they were heard from the cosmos, right? There's something about a language or something about the, 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 the um, formula, the series of sounds that confers upon uh, the, the ritual, the presence of what's being uttered, right? We can maybe talk a little bit more about the, 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 the the esoteric mechanics of this, if you will, but but just understand that 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 this that the, the Vedic revelation is a compilation of hymns that were preserved in oral memory for a very very long time, and were codified and written down. You know, the the, the, the Rig Veda, anyways, uh, conservatively was written down 1500 BCE. This is 1500 centuries before Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth, right? This is a thousand years before the Buddha. This is a long time ago. And these are conservative estimates. Yes, ancient, ancient, ancient Indo-European religion, Vedic religion. You know, uh, this religion is, is the religion of originally a, a nomadic people who, who are looking for prosperity, for progeny, for grain, for cattle. This is what life is about. You know, they they wish to prosper here, and when they're done, avoid hell and go to heaven. Right? This is the Vedic world view, not dissimilar from what is often pejorative, pejor, pejoratively referred to as the pagan worldview or a pagan tradition, like ancient Greek uh, or Mesopotamian religion, for example. Right, so this is the soil of the jungle. This is the ancient, ancient sediment of Vedic culture. And what's fascinating about uh, India, civilization in India, not necessarily only nationalistic India, what's fascinating about South Asia or India is this penchant towards syncretism. Right, we'll take this and then we'll layers and layers of layers of folding in of ideas. This, this sort of this, this, this propensity to integrate a various strata of, of, of thought, of culture, of, of belief, of practice. But the soil in the jungle of Hinduism is Vedic, of that there is no doubt. Right? And that is where we see the ideology uh, and the narrative of an afterlife in a more conventional sense. Right. This is where we see the emphasis on uh, the, the pitrus, right? These are, these are, it literally means father, it can mean parents, it can mean ancestors, forefathers in much better translation. Our textbook author has chosen to translate it literally as father, the world of the fathers. I'd say the world of the ancestors is probably a better uh, conveyance of the sense or, or forefathers if you want something a little more literal. Right? This is where we want to go. We want to go to the abode of the ancestors. Pitri loka. Loka just means world. Yes. World of the father, forefather. <laughs> the spiritual realm of ancestors who receive proper burial 
and ritual, ritual offerings after death. It is one of many spiritual and physical planes in which one might be reborn from one lifetime to another. So there's a variety, multiplicity of planes. But this is where we want to get. We, we want to facilitate the journey of the, 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 the departed, the dearly departed. Well, dearly or not, they've departed. Perhaps it's the happily departed. Who knows? But we want to facilitate the journey of the departed to the realm of the ancestors, the Pitiroka. Right? Because this is a place of, of enjoyment. This is a place of feasting. This is a place of, if, 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 you know, if you're like, wow, this sounds awfully familiar, I'd say, yes, well, this is very similar to uh, Indo-European conceptions of the afterlife. It's a realm of light. Yes. Uh, this is a place where you can have women, whether you're into women or not. <laughs> whether you're male or female and into women or not, you can enjoy women there. <laughs> you can enjoy food there and drink there and lush, breezy landscapes. This is starting to sound like an infomercial for the afterlife. Anyhow, um, this is a delightful place to be. You don't want to go to hell. No one does. Yeah? You know, there's, in the, in the earliest uh, conceptions, and this should also sound familiar to you from, from our, our, our unit on, um, ancient Near Eastern religions, that there it's murky, right? It's We're not quite sure what hell looks like. You know, later in the Atarva Veda, we see that, or we hear that it's a, it's a black darkness. It's, a, it's, 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 it's an abyss. And then even later in the Brahmanas, it's class of text, and this is all in, 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 in Mormon, uh, we get this <laughs> alarmingly similar idea that it's a fiery place where the sinners shall perish. This is, uh, uh, I'm hard pressed to not imagine there was some sort of cultural cross pollination at play here. What do I know? But this is interesting. Though. There's also this notion of the fires of hell. Could it be that there's an actual hell the Rishis could see and there's fires there? Could it be that <laughs> so might say Billy the Believer, Debbie, Debbie the, the Doubter might be like, oh, come on. Obviously, there was some. You know, a transmission of ideas, uh, you know, across uh, from these these different regions, this idea spread, or or the or she may even say, no, actually, you know, uh, somewhere in our primordial past, humans witnessed volcanoes, <laughs> and the volcano to them <laughs> presented as like a fire from the earth erupting and this angry volcanic motion was like this, there's this great wrath and anger and, and, and even evil down in the earth in fiery form. What do I know? I'm making it up as I go along, but you get the idea. So, Yama, not Osiris in this case. Yama is the god or the lord of the dead. In uh, ancient Vedic hymns, Yama is a heroic figure who actually succeeds in overcoming death. And he becomes the Lord of the Dead. Now, when you have a, a cultural history that's so, so ancient, you'll have characters that are resurrected epoch after epoch. So in the text that I study in the Puranas, say from roughly 1500 years ago, compared to the Rig Veda, that's young. <laughs> It's 2,000 years later than the Rig Veda, but it's still 15 centuries. It, it, it's fascinating, right? The distance between Jesus Christ and us is 2,000 years. That's the distance between the Rig Veda and the mythological text that I study. That's the difference. Nevertheless, those texts are still contemporaneous with, um, with Muhammad. And it, it, it's so fascinating. Anyhow, you'll see I'm a worked and be worked in various mythological iterations. So you'll see mythic figures that appear throughout the ages. They'll have different significations, different stories. They're fleshed out, they're appropriated, they're colored, they're nuanced. So what we could say about that, but we won't because we have to move on. The Yama is, is you know, we, we want to get to the delights of the afterlife, right? We want to become a Pitru, Pitri, if you're North Indian. 
It's one of the few sounds that are pronounced one of two ways, generally. Uh, co <laughs> contrary to what I just said about Sanskrit being extraordinarily stable. Uh, you know, this, this, uh, this idea, this, 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 this notion that, look, someone's died, and my goodness, there, are, there is the propensity of them being a hungry ghost. This, this, this notion that we see everywhere of the, of the ghost that's not satisfied, someone who hasn't, hasn't been satisfied in life or satisfied in their death or satisfied uh, in, the, in, the, in the rituals or circumstances following their death. And they may become this like, you know, this vampire-like entity that, that wreaks havoc for the living. Sounds familiar. You know, this sounds very familiar. This is something that seems to be a mainstay in, in, in human experience, or at least in the religious imagination. Uh, this idea that there's a there's a disembodied being that's not so happy and is making your life not so happy. This idea of sort of a haunted or haunting uh, um, a being, a preta. Right. So someone dies. They're a ghoul. <laughs> they're ghost. Okay. What you want to do is help them move along and graduate to becoming an ancestor, to the realm of the ancestors. Go towards the light. And how do you want to do that? Well, you want to do that by the same means that you do everything in this, in this religious system, ritual. Ritual, precise enunciation, like a sacred fire, somebody who's of a certain caste with uh, tons of training, making certain offerings at certain times, with certain mantric uh, invocations, and the, the, the rigor with which the ritual is performed translates to its success, translates to you accomplishing the goal for which you are performing this ritual. And one could perform a ritual for a variety of reasons. I want to do this ritual because I want to get my PhD, or whatever it is. But in this case, we're talking about a ritual that's particularly geared towards the pacification of a departed spirit. Right? And this ritual, I mean, there's a number of people involved, but typically it needs to be performed by uh, one's eldest son. Yes, women are an afterthought in the system, in some ways, in many ways, right? It's a patriarchal system. This is one of, in Vedic culture, one of the reasons for which you need to, 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 to have a son is though so that the rituals can be done on your behalf when you're passed on and, and your life can be secure. And there are even stories in the Mahabharata of this, this idea, this ancient Vedic idea of, well, if the rituals aren't being done by the, your progeny, your, right? Then like if, if, if we don't do rituals for our ancestors and they're not getting those checks, they run out of merit and they end up in hell realms. Those are checks. They need those checks to stay in the, in the penthouses of, of Pithrilok or wherever they are. And if we don't send them those ritual checks, you know, then their, their funds dry up, their punya, their merit, their grace dries up, and they end up somewhere very unhappy. And when they're unhappy, guess what? Yes, you guessed it. We're unhappy. They make us unhappy because we've made them unhappy because we haven't done the rituals to keep them in their, 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 their penthouse um, abodes. Right. So this is the Vedic worldview. It's uh, highly world affirming, uh, highly sort of, sort of, you know, this isn't uh, dissimilar to worldviews we've seen before. But then, sometime about, I don't know, 2,700 years ago-ish, 2,800 years ago-ish, there's a sweeping revolution across the Indian subcontinent of these crazy folks <laughs> who are intent on saying, Oh, for, forget you and forget your ritual, all right? This is all nonsense. The truth is within you. It's not in the ritual. The divine is within you. Get rid of, get rid of all of this apparatus. Go uh, close the Zoom window right now. Uh, De-enroll from the class. Take your laptop and all your possessions and throw them into the Bow River. 
get thee to some kind of ashrama or hermitage or, or, or sort of sacred place where there is some some person who is uh, aware, cognizant of the divine, who is who has realized uh, the self fully or in, in part, find such a one and study with them, because that's what it's all about. This is the classical Hindu worldview. This 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 ideology has so successfully supplanted Vedic ideology that this is the face. This is, you know, Christianity didn't come up with new cosmology. So Christianity uses the cosmology of Judaism. The Upanishadic religion was able to supplant this cosmology by and large. While there is still the belief in, in afterlife ghosts and the need for, for pacification of the ancestors, absolutely. There is the more dominant belief that that is an order of reality that is um, not ultimate, that we ourselves ultimately, we are not pitris, we're not pretas, we're not uh, even humans, we ourselves. We have multiple times to come around on this wheel of samsara. The universe has no beginning and has no end, right? We, we, we strive here not to pacify the gods and prosper on the earth. Nobody prospers on the earth. It's all an illusion. We strive here to get out of this cage. And yes, you may have a comfortable cage where we bring you food and water regularly. And you may maybe, maybe even nice curtains in your cage. If that tickles your fancy. But a golden cage is still a cage and you're still trapped. You're trapped in this bodily experience. You're trapped in, you know, the nonsense in your brain that tells you all kinds of things about reality that you think is, is true, but it's just conditioning. You're not the hardware. You're not the software. You're much more than that. You're the electric current that powers it all, powers all appliances. Go for yourselves. Close the Zoom window and go. <laughs> You're not a student. You're not a Calgarian. You're not an ethnic this or that or whatever the heck you've told yourself or society has told you you are or you aren't. You're none of these things. If I say to you, I have a body, well, that means my body is not me. I'm the owner of the body. If I say to you, I have a mind, it means the mind is not me. I own my mind. I can't control my mind today. You know, it's thinking about this or that, or it's longing or it's preoccupied. Well, are you your brain? Well, then if you say my brain, who is the me who owns the brain? Who are you? You're, you're the self. You're the supreme self. You're not the conditioning of this life or all of your previous lives. You're much, much, much more than that. You're the power of consciousness that pervades all things and animates this apparatus such that you think that you are. You have individual agency. You think that you are separate. But you're an appliance propelled by the same current that flows through all appliances. Enough of this waxing poetically about the nature of the self, the nature of the supreme. That's all good and well. Okay, Dr. Raj, thank you. I'm so glad that I now know I'm the supreme, but you know, my illness hasn't gone away. My mother still hates me or she pretends to some days or I pretend to hate her because you know, I have passive aggressive tendencies or I'm avoidant or both. Um, and, um, you know, you know, this guy I like who doesn't like me back is starting to really piss me off. So then what's all that? That's karma. That's karma. That is, uh, karma is the metaphysical principle, but karma is also the result of the metaphysical principle of just desserts. You know, your nature is because of your previous actions. Your, 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 your circumstance, that too, is because of your karma. And this is all just the stuff that's ripening. 
you know, you have Calgary karma. Apparently, I have Calgary karma. I never did I see myself leaving Toronto. All of a sudden, I'm on a plane to do a PhD. Okay, I thought I was done. All of a sudden this year, I have a job at Calgary. All of a sudden, an old Calgary friend came into my life. All of a sudden, a client came into my life that has nothing to do with any of those things. It happens to be from Calgary. Calgary karma has right lo and behold. <laughs> Because the, the, the residue of that karma is part of your being, but it hasn't ripened yet. So goes the story. So goes the narrative. Karma. You don't know yourself because of karma. You know, this is the problem. This is the fundamental problem. The problem is you don't know who you are. You don't know how to get out of here. You're trapped in this experience of limitation. And you need to find a way out. Sarvam Dukkam, as the Buddhist precept goes, the first noble truth that probably we'll look at next week. You know, the game of life isn't prospering in the world. That's it. The world is a game. When do you prosper? When are you done? When do you have enough money? When do you have enough power? When do you, the list goes on and on. When? You don't. It's a trap. It's a game. Opt out. Take the red pill. This is the, the perspective of classical Hindu philosophy. Yes, I talked about these terms last class. Samsara is the, the whirly go round we're all attached to. And moksha is the, samsara is the maze, and moksha, I guess, is the way out of the maze, or, or, or the state of being beyond the maze. It's a better way of putting it. And this, this whole, excuse me, this whole process is, this is what we think of as reincarnation. You've been here before, or I've been here before. Who knows as what, or when, or even why. We don't know what we were before, but we know that we were before. Right? And then we talked about this. Why on earth does anybody believe in this ridiculous children's story of a, of a religious ideology? Says you know, the doubter. In case you haven't learned by now, when I'm praising or, or, or critiquing religion, it's a pedagogic strategy. I'm not selling you anything but the ability to think for yourself. If you wish to buy that. Why would anybody believe in this? What the hell is going on here? We talked about this. I'm, I'm, I, I presented all of the slides last class for a reason, and I'm revisiting them for a different reason. You know, last class, we were talking about the structural opposition or the comparison of the Abrahamic worldview and the classical Hindu worldview. But even within Hinduism, we have this tension between this ancient, ancient Vedic piece and this classical Hindu piece. It's a really fascinating worldview. And one of the reasons why one might say it's fascinating is because it does a decent job of accounting for much of human experience. That doesn't mean you have to buy it or not buy it but to entertain the merits intellectually of why one would ascribe to this worldview. You know, one, someone once said, was in a class one day, and there was a debate, <laughs> debate between two of my classmates, this was a long time ago. Um, and it was a heated debate about whether, you know, God was responsible for everything or karma. And then one, one person said to the other, so what, what do you think? There's no justice? Do you think God's cruel? What do you think? If not karma, then what? Is God cruel or is he impotent? Which is he? <laughs> I don't have any answers for you. But the problem of people and the problem of, 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 of meeting out of justice is a problem that's plagued Christian theology for some time because it, it's a problem, right? The Hindus would say, well, that's karma. Suffering is because of karma. Not just suffering, who you are, your gifts, your predilections, your tendencies. Well, you people have gifts because they've, they've done stuff before you. Of course, she's way better than you with the violin. She's had like 50 years of experience, although she's just picking it up this month in this life. Of course, you suck. You, you, this, is, this is your first month holding a violin bow. 
she's done it for 50 years and her something in her being remembers she just has to remind herself yeah, yeah of course uh, kindred spirit is a great expression you have in english what does that mean or a soulmate what does that mean not just a soulmate in the sense of you know this idea that i have one partner a romantic partner i mean a soulmate in terms of a kindred spirit or someone that you feel drawn to or you have an instant sense of connection with and it doesn't have to do with hormones necessarily or or prejudice uh, for good or for ill it has to do with oh we just this we're sort of tied at the soul somehow well this theory says well then that's because you know that person you have karma with that person the threads of karma bind you. They're invisible, but they're powerful. They bind you from life to life. If you look at your close karmas, the people that are here for a long time in your life, either you owe them big time or they owe you big time. <laughs> it's rarely 50-50. Or you may have an affinity with a culture. I use the example of my friend who one day flew to Japan. He loves Japanese food. He just he experienced no culture shock. He just felt like, okay, Japan's home. No one knows why. He feels like he used to live in Japan in some life that he can't remember. Who knows? We'll talk about past life memories in one of the later chapters of this course. But you see, this raises an interesting issue because all the Mormon does his job in terms of presenting Vedic religion and presenting ancestor worship and presenting the journey of Preta to Pitri and presenting this as as a sort of comparable, because you know, a comparable, comparable, comparative religion. He's comparing religion, it's a comparative enterprise. He does his job to present that of, of a hell realm or a heavenly realm full of delights and women and good food. He talks about that. He foregrounds that. In my view, what he fails to foreground, either because it's not part of the project he's after or because he just didn't cognize it, is that um, the vast majority of Hindus prioritize the, the, the notion that the hereafter life is right here. And sometimes these views are held in tandem. You know, there's a really interesting idea in, in ancient Egyptian religion that we talked about. You know, these two, the ka and the ba, these two aspects of self, one that becomes the, the ghoul, the, the disembodied sort of ghost to haunt the living or, or not, and the other that moves on. And, you know, there's no cohesive um, philosophy or theology about it, but it really sort of, that sort of dual nature, um, it illumines kind of what we see in the Hindu world where yes there are ancestors yes you know uh, some sort of a residue or spirit moves on but it's such that just so just as this world is illusory uh, and ultimately not permanently real despite the manifestations the variegated manifestations within it and beings you know, so too are the spirit realms this is what Advaita Vedanta would say, so too are the spirit realms, so, so too are the realms of the ancestors, so too are even the realms of the gods, all of the realms, visible and invisible, physical and metaphysical, all of the realms are conditional, perspectival, provisional. They're all ultimately illusory. Your afterlife is here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here until you don't want to be here anymore and you work really hard to not be here anymore because you realize you're in a cage and see